I wrote cursive circles on the sheets of paper, careful to keep my words between the blue lines on the page. Slowly the thin notebook filled with make-believe stories that I had been told, with stories that I wanted to tell. My name is Ndokalia Ya and I am the author of The Late Homecomer and I'm also its narrator for the audio version. I feel so fortunate to be, um, want to have grown up in Minnesota surrounded by so many phenomenal uh, writers in the community. You know, I didn't know any of them, but I went to the public libraries and I read their books. And I, I really believe, especially after Columbia, that St. Paul, Minneapolis is the place to be if you're a young writer. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for audiences who are willing to take risks mm -hmm. and, um, and publishers who are willing to support your work. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I'm so happy that Coffeehouse Press chose my book and I I feel so fortunate to be published by by you all. It's just really <laughs> wonderful. Great. I'm so proud to be a Minnesota author and so privileged to be able to say that I come from Minnesota publishers. And then there's the other part of it. I think that this is the place for a Hmong writer to come forth. Yeah. The women in my life, perhaps because of my grandmother, but also just because of who they are individually, all very incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. um, I think to come from a culture that is often, I think, understood to be um, incredibly gender biased, mm -hmm. um, I've always felt the strength of the woman in my in my life. You know, Grandma was the matriarch, and now my mom and my aunts all understand that they're all going to have to become matriarchs, a family unit, and that to do to do that well, you have to be responsible, integrity, um, but more than anything, that you have to garner the respect of the young and the old alike. And so they're wonderful, wonderful role models for me. When Do and I were divided, I lost the few English words I had grown comfortable with. English was hard on my tongue. I was learning the meanings of words and how to write them, but my voice sounded different to me in English. I didn't like the way I stuttered and breathed through the words, so I tried never to speak it unless it was necessary, in which case I started whispering everything that came out of my mouth. So I was a selective mute for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, when I was six, my mom and I were at Kmart and somebody walked away um, when my mom was asking for light bulbs because she didn't have the word. So she pointed to the ceiling and she said she was looking for the thing that made the world shiny. And mm -hmm. the clerk walked away, left my mom standing there and she started looking at her feet. She was ashamed to be with me. And so I decided that if the world didn't need to hear my mom and dad, then it didn't need to hear me. So the mm -hmm. next day I stopped talking. And um, those separation didn't help things, you know. So when the book came out, the night of the book launch, that was my first night of public speaking. Because I had gone by just doing the thumbs up and nodding, mm -hmm. and everything was just good. Um, or that's the way I, I communicated everything. Um, so that night I couldn't speak. And my father uh, got up and he came in front of all these people to hold my hand because I was standing there shaking. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he says, if Hmong tears can reincarnate, then the world would reign in our sorrow. But because they cannot, they can only green the mounds of Pumbia. But your words, if you speak, if the winds of humanity blow, then our lives would not have been lost. Yeah. I speak because of my father's words. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to be, to be able to to speak to people inside their cars and their and their ears, it's so cool, it's such a wonderful concept. I want to be able to tell my father that even when my voice is tired, it still speaks. Because mm -hmm. my heart doesn't rest. I want him to know that I really heard his words. Mm -hmm. And that they're really much a part of the work that I do. And so it was super exciting. All, all along the way, um, I've had this notion that I have an incredibly weak voice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a voice that hasn't been used very much, so it's a rusty voice. But that's a part of the story that I, that I come from, and that is a part of the story that I tell. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like it's, it's a necessary fit. So I was really excited when Chris told me that Highbridge was interested in having me serve as the reader.
Grandma would tell me the stories of her life from long ago. I had heard them many times. When I listened to the cadence of her voice, the rhythm of her speech, I stopped hearing the words. Her stories were like music, like the words of a timeless classic, a love ballad played again and again. If I had not thought her disobedient, I could have recited her stories along with her, in tune with her voice. My grandma never went to school and she never learned how to um, read or write. All of her life she'd sign her name with a shaky X. When I was a little kid we couldn't afford long distance phone calls so my sister and I used to write her and I pressed so hard on the page because I wanted her to feel my words even if she couldn't read them. And um, growing up whenever she saw my handwriting she'd always say you write like so... Um, she said you, you write your words on the page with so much authority and she do feel them. Yeah. The, the morning that my grandma passed away, um, my aunts went through her stuff. When I came back there was a pile in the corner swept together, just trash ready to go out and it was all the letters uh, my sister and I had sent her. And she kept them all. She kept them all and some of them she'd touched so many times that the ink had started to run. When I first started writing the book, everybody in my family and, and just in the community, they said, what are you doing in New York? And I say, I'm writing a story. And they say, what is the story about? And I say, it's our story. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, when do we get to read it? <laughs> and I'd say, um, soon, <laughs> soon. Um, when the book was ready to go out, I sent it to some literary agents in New York. And some of the responses I got back were that uh, Vietnam was a horrible chapter in American history. and then people didn't want to revisit that chapter and then outside of Minnesota, Wisconsin and California nobody knew who the Hmong were. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me it was so important to have the book published. More important than who would read it was the fact that I understood it would be one of the first to be published um, in America yeah. from the Hmong perspective. And then there was also this bigger thing that I knew, you know, Minnesota is like 150 years old. This is a really new country. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so many generations ago that people's, people's Englishes were built on the sacrifice of accents like my mother and my father's. Right, right. That so many of us come from somewhere to call this place home. Right. There was a Somali student who I knew wasn't until the 1970s that they came to a Vin language. For the Hmong it was the 1950s. I was telling a story about refugees in a world that was creating more and more of them all the time. Yeah. And so there were so many, to me, so many reasons to, to just put it out there. And I believed that when people read it, they would understand. If you've ever loved a grandma, been held by hands, dry as paper, you know what that feels like. It didn't matter what culture you came from. If you've ever lost somebody you really loved. So there were all these universal elements pulling me through, pulling my hopes and dreams through. And then my daddy has this line and he loves it. He says, if you dream in the right direction, that you never wake up and the dream never dies, that it always, always gets bigger. When Coffee House Press accepted the book, Chris Fishbach said, um, you know, we're a small press, we're going to make like 5,000 run and we'll see how that does. You know, for poetry, if you still have 2,000, it's a really a good book. And, and, and in my heart, I kept on wondering, when are we going to get there? You know, when audio, or when Highbridge Audio was interested in the book, I say, oh my God, all of a sudden the dream has gone bigger and I'm still, I'm still in the dream. In writing, I always said that I was going to be the first audience for my, for, for, for my pages. And then if I didn't feel it, there was no chance my readers were. The same is true. I'm learning in, in, in recording this. I'm still the first audience for the words I speak not just what I write. Mm -hmm. I hope that in listening to, to me read from the book that, that my audience will hear the words of my father and my grandmother, of my mother and my aunts, my uncles, and that they will hear the, the hope and the dream of my generation, the conviction that we're here together because we belong together, that when we talk about the American dream it is very much 
in stories like mine and lives like mine. It's what I hope. That it wouldn't be my voice alone.